Hello, Namaste, everyone. Uh, welcome again to this today's session on financing for college. Uh, this is activity part of SMAP Youth. Uh, those of you who do not know SMAP, SMAP is is a affiliated organization with uh, Shivaji Maharaj America Parivar. And the purpose for youth uh, is to help out our youth with uh, anything they need for their college uh, to make them better leaders of tomorrow, equip them with uh, proper knowledge about our Indian heritage, give them information about the American society we live in uh, as it comes to college, financing for college. We did a career seminar a few years ago, and uh, this is literally empowering youth. Uh, we are two SMP youth clubs in colleges. Uh, we have one in Mountain House uh, and one in Seymour, Connecticut. Uh, so if any of you like to start a SMP youth in our high school, uh, please let us know. Uh, and uh, we'll be able to help you out with anything that's required to start a club. So today we have uh, two uh, esteemed speakers with us. I'm honored to have both of them, uh, despite their busy schedule uh, with personal uh, family uh, challenges. I, I appreciate them being on the call today to help us out. And uh, some of you might might know on the call, uh, Sadhanaji. Uh, so we have Sadhanaji's family actually on the call. Some people did not know. So I want to make sure I, I introduce you as uh, Sadhanaji's husband and Sadhanaji's daughter, Isha. Um, so the focus for today is financing for college. Uh, and, and we're thinking this is more of a youth topic, but honestly, it's youth and parents topic. So as a parent, you have to pay for it. Uh, I'm sure youth can take a loan, uh, but uh, it starts with parents. Uh, they have to plan for funding for this college, college uh, education. And uh, some of us are wealthy, some of us are not. And it's always a question in our mind, uh, should we pay for the tuition, 40,000 fees or 60,000 fees? Or we should not pay for it upfront, right? Should we just take the loan and then pay it over a period of time, right? So not every one of us have financial degrees and knowledge. Uh, so we requested uh, Chaitanya Ji, uh, who has put three kids to college, great colleges, as well as uh, he has a background in financing. He is a managing director of a pretty large hedge fund uh, here in Southern California and, and a very successful track record in financing. Uh, including managing your, his own personal finances. I think he's doing a good job in, in doing that as well. Right, Chaitanya Ji? Well, I'll try. That's what <laughs> we all try, exactly. So um, I'll be very brief. I will give you introduction of both of them at a very high level and just hand it over to them to educate us on the financing process. Uh, as well as uh, Isha is in, I think, third year right now in college, and she will be a good um, kind of mentor guidance for us to uh, let us know what works in college, how to settle down in college, right? So financing is step one, and step two is going from there, right? So at some point in time, you'd like to get some scholarship, assistantship, on-campus job, right? Uh, and then and other opportunities in the college. So she will educate us on that, um, and uh, brief bio, Chaitanya Ji did his engineering uh, from Bangalore University. He did his Master of Science in, from Utah University, as well as uh, MBA in, from Pepperdine University. And as I mentioned, he is with uh, uh, the Hishman and managing a big, big portfolio. Uh, Isha graduated from Whitney High School a couple of years ago. She is pursuing uh, BS in technology, computer technology. Uh, I think she's on Dean's List, uh, full ride from the college, and very bright student. And we're honored to have her here to share her experience on uh, literally what works in college, how to settle down. Uh, she, by the way, grew up in Southern California, born in Southern California, raised in Southern California, and now in, uh, in Rochester, which is kind of an inland part of America, right? So there are cultural parts of uh, settling down, as well as there are other parts of settling down, like you're alone there. You don't have your parents with you. you. Don't have your friends with you. Right? How to cope up with that? In addition to the new workload that you're going to take up as as a part of your curriculum, right? So she will help us uh, with that as well. So that's a brief uh, intro for both of them. And as I mentioned, I'll try to be really brief. So uh, with that, I would like to pass it on to Chaitanya Ji. So thank you so much, Vijayji, for that uh, brief introduction. I think. Uh... 
we can get ahead with the program right now. Uh, what we uh, I we kind of thought about uh, me and Isha was to first go with what was Isha's experience, right? She being a student, uh, what did she go through with her first year, second year, uh, third year? Uh, in terms of not just money, but also in terms of her experience in, at the university, I see it, there must be a lot of parents uh, here and students. Uh, we thought it would be best to start off with something that would give them what it is like to be a student and uh, how does money play into it, right? Uh, so what I can tell you is that Isha is going to first talk about uh, her university that she's going to, which is RIT. Uh, how did she make friends and for her social life? How did she make them home away from home? How, what was Dom living versus living in an apartment? Uh, what, do, what did she expect in terms of classes and grades? Um, money matters. So she's going to talk about money and how family, Hi, come here. Uh, how family counts uh, in terms of, uh, you know, your support system and what is self-management all about. With that, I'll let uh, Isha take over and talk a little bit. Okay. Hello, um, my name is Isha. So during my freshman year at RIT, um, there's a lot of like uh, pros and cons of going to college for the first time. Um, so when I went to college, it was COVID time. So there was not a lot of socialization, um, but still my school had like in-person classes. So one of the pros I had like is I made lots of friends and then um, I had more freedom in terms of like I could set my schedule how I wanted. I could wake up whenever I wanted. Um, so I wasn't a big party person in college, but in terms of freedom, I felt like I had a lot of freedom to, to kind of schedule my day however I wanted. Um, one of some of the cons that I had, some of the things I struggled with was homesickness um, and then mental health because of it was COVID and I didn't have like my family with me. Um, I also struggled to deal with uh, stress and time management. Next slide. Um, so here are some tips I have for dealing with homesickness. So one of the things you can do is decorate your uh, dorm or your room that you're going to stay in. So this kind of helps you feel like you're at home whenever you come back. Um, another tip I have is finding a trusted support system. So this could be family, friends, friends, families, or even like family friends. So for me, my parents, um, in their case, they had had some family friends, um, which they knew. So I was able to go to their house. I was able to stay over and that helped me overcome homesickness. So I felt uh, more at home. I felt like I was at home with like my family because I was staying with another family um, sometimes. Uh, and then I also recommend celebrating your festivals with them. So you can celebrate like Ganpati, Holi, Diwali. So that helps you kind of cope with homesickness. Uh, I also know that a lot of universities have um, international Indian student groups. So a lot of times those systems become your family away from home. Um, and homesickness will last days, like even weeks, um, but like you can overcome it. So that's what I wanna tell the youth. Uh, next slide. So for money, I recommend finding uh, thrift shops. So you can get very like cheap things from thif thrift shops. There's uh, student Facebook pages uh, where you can get cheap furniture, cheap clothes. Um, students are like selling things on uh, certain Facebook pages. Uh, you can uh, find used books. So books are pretty expensive in college, um, but if you find them used, you get them for free. Uh, I would uh, cook at home. So learn basic dishes and then have like meal prep. So plan out your meals for the entire week. Um, and then some of the tools I recommend are like Instapot air fryer. Uh, so Instapot is good for like kitchen or like something that's like very quick where you can throw it in and it will be done while you're like studying. Um, and then another thing I recommend is to budget your money and keep the total rent money aside to avoid spending it. So typically in my area, rent money is like 500 a month or even it can go 
go up to like a thousand a month. So you want to make sure that you keep all your rent money, however much you have aside, so you don't spend that money. Uh, maybe keeping it into a like savings account. Uh, next slide. Um, so for academics and stress, I recommend finish assignments two days before the due date. So this makes sure that if you have anything wrong in your assignment, you can double check it and you can get like a higher grade on it. But also it helps with stress. So if anything else comes up, you can focus on that. Um, have a set schedule and treat school like a full time job. Stop studying at a certain time, like 6 p.m., 7 p.m. Uh, don't study at all after that point. So this helps you have like a work life balance. So you won't think about school after it's done, uh, which I think is a good way to like ease tension off of your mind. Um, I also recommend finding free tutoring centers and attending office hours. So schools offer like these free services. So you don't have to pay for tutoring. You can get tutoring for free. So these services really like helped me get really high grades because I would go to like the tutoring centers. I'd sit there and I'd do my homework. So I'd never try to do anything like by myself. I'd always try to make sure that someone's like around me so I can like ask for help. And that also saved me time. Um, I would also recommend changing your study space. So around campus, I, I would sit um, at different places uh, every day to make sure that I can vary, you know, vary my where I'm sitting. So as you can see, I have like a pretty background here. So this helps me like um, feel less stressed. Uh, and then I also want the youth to remember that failing a class is not the end of uh, so I'm in Rochester, New York. Uh, so it's near upstate New York. So we have a lot of like, um, a lot of like beautiful like fall colors because the seasons change so often. Uh, and then I, I want the youth to remember that, you know, failing a class is not the end of your career. You can still take that class over the summer and get credit for it. So a lot of students get very stressed. They get very overwhelmed. So um, yeah. And then uh, I want to talk about my university's internship program. So we have a one year required internship program. These are like some of the universities that offer it. So my university is RIT. They offer it. Uh, there's Northeastern and there's Drexel University. So some universities will charge you during like they'll charge you tuition during uh, doing your internship. But you want to look for universities that don't require you to pay during your internship time. Uh, next slide. Um, so for me, I don't have to pay during my time that I work. And then I also get money from my internship experience. So um, the blocks that are like blank here without any blocks, those are when I'm like full time working. So I'm not doing any classes. I'm not paying any money. I'm just like earning money. So that helps me. Uh, pay off my loans or like pay for any like, like extra expenses. Next. Uh, and now um, my dad will go over investing in the spreadsheet. Yeah, one of the big things I can tell you about uh, Isha when I looked for universities was I looked for a co-op program mainly because uh, the the there is a plus factor to it. Uh, having a one-year experience by the time you graduate out was a huge is a huge thing. Many graduates don't come out of universities having that company experience. Uh, universities like uh, Drexel, RIT, Northwestern offer these programs. Yes, it takes longer to graduate, but at the same time, when a, a student comes out with work experience, it's important. Not to say that folks that go to four-year universities uh, shouldn't uh, take care of the, you know, take advantage of their summers. So if you're thinking that, oh yeah, my kids uh, finished just as first year, who's gonna employ him or her? Uh, don't think that way. I think yeah, first year internships are pretty much available. Like Isha is right now interning at um, Northrop Grumman. Uh, she has a, a bunch of freshmen that have, have had applied for the internship. And it's really important to tell your students to go to these internship fairs in the first year 
Typically in, the, in fall, uh, various companies will come offer internships. So it's very important freshmen actually show up there and other, other, other people in different years should just go show up there, try to get your internships because that summer that you spend uh, gaining work experience can also be the summer that you are earning money, uh, essentially. Why I, uh, I'm talking about that is mainly because, again, everything, you're making the largest investment in your life, uh, which is uh, education, right? Uh, Warren Buffett very famously said, in a recession, what do you do? The best thing you can do is have a job and maintain a job and have good education. So uh, taking a leaf out of that, I would say that's that's one of the big things. Another thing is, uh, today I uploaded the presentation, along with that presentation, I uploaded a spreadsheet. Uh, please take a look at that spreadsheet. Uh, it's just a kind of a starter template. Uh, use it any way that you want to use it. Uh, it's, it's, it's on your, it's about your university hunt. Another thing is uh, cover things like visiting universities. Um, well, the other thing I'm going to cover today is uh, sources of financial aid. Uh, how do you work with your parents uh, about your school? It's a huge decision you're making. And I'll uh, briefly touch upon FAFSA. This may not relate to people that are non-US citizens, but uh, nonetheless, it's uh, good to be informed a little bit. Uh, individual countries may have different programs, uh, such as study abroad and things like that, uh, which I'm not quite aware about, but uh, those are things that you might have to take a look at. In India, of course, I know the banks give loans for, uh, for education. So I just want to go over why I think it's, a, it's an important decision when it, goes to, when it comes to college or university. If you think about it, right, just look at the cumulative uh, loan it, in this case, it's just about uh, women, uh, women that go to college, but men are not very far behind in this statistic. If you see, uh, as far as the Asian, uh, Asian, Asian essentially Indians are counted as Asians, an average student comes out of the university with a $70,000 loan. And if that $70,000 loan needs to be paid off, it's going to take a chunk of your money out of your university when you are uh, out there working. So on average, you're paying around $307. So $307 is what you're gonna pay um, out of your earnings is when, you, when you're not trying to pay back that $70,000 loan. So with that being said, it means that whenever you go to university, you're gonna think about, can I make that $307 loan? So essentially it all comes down to finance is the way I see it. So with that said, you should really choose your school wisely. When it comes to choosing your school, I've provided that spreadsheet. There are various criteria. There's one spreadsheet we have shown as to which uh, schools provide how much level of uh, scholarship. Uh, it's a spread, it's on the second tab. You will see it. Um, some schools provide up to 70%. Some schools provide up to 90%. Um, some schools provide as low as 30% and 20%. So keeping that in mind when you're actually trying to apply for universities is important. Another thing is in-state schools versus uh, private schools or something that's a semi-private like the UC system. They, in California, you've got the UC system, but in other states, they may have other, other uh, systems, uh, including the state-sponsored ones. The big decision you really need to make is this. If your kid is trying to go in to a, a program uh, that is not going to earn that much uh, once that person graduates, then you it's time to think about, okay, can I send this kid for two years to college, which is the, the, the local colleges which are available, right? And then take that step up to going to university the second two years. But that again depends upon your child. It depends upon you making uh, that wise choice uh, in, in terms of uh, understanding your child. Because a lot of children will go into uh, local colleges, uh, which is like here in Southern California, you've got uh, the Cerritos College, you've got other colleges which offer 
a two-year uh, program in different specialties. Uh, that the, the problem there is you've got a variability of the population there. Uh, so if your kid is a good, has a good ac academic track record, you're able to uh, guarantee that, that your kid will be able to study those two years and, and get through those two years properly, then you, by all means, go to that uh, local college and get that, uh, get the two years out. Uh, but if you're going for a professional degree, like if you're thinking of going into the uh, the STEM uh, STEM world, and if you're trying to get into becoming an engineer, then by all means go to your university. Uh, try not to send your kid to a, a local college, uh, for the yeah. most part, right? Uh, the other thing is, like I said, about scholarships, right? The different types of scholarships that are offered by different universities. One of the things that they can do is they can give an outright scholarship, which is just money on the table, and you get you know that cuts out your tuition costs based upon your student's grade, uh, based upon your student's uh, academic ab ability or sportsman ability. The the thing is, much of the Indian community is mainly focused on academics. I can just I tell can you. Just I can just tell you from my experience that a lot of the extracurricular activities really don't matter. Um, for example, you know, the UC system doesn't even ask for an essay uh, and doesn't really focus that much on while admitting students. They're mainly focused on what is what how what are the your grades at school and what is your SAT score. That's the other thing. Even if they say SAT is optional. It's not optional. Don't take that as an optional, especially if your kid is going to a very tough school, like my, you know, Isha went to a very tough school, like Whitney. That SAT matters mainly because that score is kind of a supplementary score that they're always going to take a look at, and when they when they when they consider someone for admission, even though they say they don't. So just just keep that in mind and do that. The other thing is also APs. If you're going to spend your time and money on APs, make sure that your your that money that you're spending on those APs is worth it. Because when you go to the university, the university is only going to give you credit for those APs based upon your major and based upon what score you get. So yeah, I can just tell you, if your kid can get a score of four and above, then by all means go take an AP. Okay, but if your kid's not going to get that four and above score, um, it may not be worth it, okay? It can help in the, uh, the course that they might have to repeat at school. Another thing is they have an income share agreement. Uh, universities like Purdue have uh, a program where they'll give you a loan, but the, the student, once they graduate, they're going to share a part of their income, meaning make a payment to the university uh, as part of the income. And that is tailored towards what salary they, they get when they graduate. So uh, try to ask about these programs, right? The other thing is cost of living. Uh, you, if you're gonna get, uh, your kid's gonna get full scholarship, but if the area that they're gonna live in has rents of $2,000, then you gotta really think about, please add that money when you're thinking about uh, sending your kid, the, your kid has got admission to, to four colleges, but then that's the time that you gotta start thinking about, okay, what's the cost of living in that area? Which is, which may, what makes sense? Then always research the job prospects for the, for your major. And as I've talked about previously, summer internship opportunities. So when you talk about visiting university, uh, visiting universities, ask to speak to a student in that major. If you're there, you should. If your kid's going to be going next year, uh, that is the September of 2024, then now is the time that you should start visiting universities. They have these uh, open houses there try to speak to students within that major. Look for the housing options that, that are available. That again comes down to your cost of living and conditions. Some universities have a requirement that you have to stay first year on campus. Some universities don't. So you gotta think about that. Visit the department, see how strong the faculty is in that department. How many students are there in that department? Is it well-funded? Um, those are things matter because that's where your scholarships are gonna come from. 
then you think about job internship you know, uh, opportunities within that university. So if it is a research university, then research universities have a lot of positions available during the summer for summer internship that adds to your student's experience. Then, uh, like I talked about previously, you know, job, job fairs as far as internship goes. See, visit the career office. When you're, while you're visiting the university, don't focus just on the academics. Go to the career office and see really how solid their program is. Ask them, okay, how many students out of your uh, career office were able to get hired uh, after their first year? Then, uh, like I talked about APs, right? What are the minimum scores that they're going to accept um, to give credit? Because every AP score, a AP uh, uh, credit they're going to give is going to reduce the cost of uh, tuition for your for your kids. The uh, in terms of sources of financial aid, right? Uh, I've given two big links here. Uh, there are lots of scholarships that are available for different reasons. It's it's literally a smorgasbord of different uh, internships that are available. Right. Um, if you go to the finaid.org, yeah, it's a pretty rich site. I will go over it a little bit briefly for you guys. Then there's, you know, grants. Grants are essentially there's the difference between a grant and a scholarship and a loan. So scholarship is money that's given to you by the university. A grant is usually some sort of a public organization that's giving you money that's not required, that's not required to be paid back. For example, if you file for the FAFSA, every parent should file for a FAFSA, regardless of what your income is. Uh, and I'll go over that as well. Uh, the, there are very solid reasons for doing that. The, uh, the, when, when it comes to uh, grants, like the Pell Grant, for example, is something that's given through FAFSA. Um, so that's money that's just on the table given out to you, and it's on the first come first serve basis. Next is you think about summer and company internships as your uh, is a thing I like talked about again. Then you can also have your student qualify as an independent student. That means if your student is in, uh, has completed their bachelor's degree, going to a graduate school, they and they're about 24 years of age, you don't have to uh, provide your financials. Everything can go over in terms of the student's finances. So as you know, students may not be earning as, as much as you are. So if they're not earning as much, they're gonna get much more financial aid and more uh, student loans from the, from the government, um, which, is, which comes down to FAFSA. ROTC is another option where certain organizations like the Army, Navy, and Air Force of the United States will actually pay for your education. There are stricter requirements. Um, there's, there's duty that's required, it's four or five years, but it's well worth it uh, if you're going to a very expensive university. So that's, that's something I, can, I would like to talk about. Another thing, why take a student loan, right? Um, one of the big things uh, that's, uh, that the Indian community does is you just want to file the FAFSA. <laughs> um, what I can tell you is this, the trick to FAFSA is this, FAFSA is on a first come first serve basis. So if you look at it, you need to um, file in before the month, like in the month of October, when uh, FAFSA opens up. It's very vital you do that. Why? Because like I said, the Pell Grant is on a first come first serve basis. Once the money that's there in the Pell Grant is exhausted, you don't get a penny. So if you're going to file that FAFSA by in June or July, it's way too late, right? So it's important that you file the FAFSA in the month of October when it opens up. As soon as it opens up, file that FAFSA, regardless of your, of your income, okay? Now the thing is, the other advantage of a government student loan is there's no cosign on needed, right? Um, that means your pair, you as a parent don't have to sign it. The student loan is on the child's um, or the child's responsibility. There's, there's a good thing. Uh, our Indian community is much like Naeem, you know, I have got to pay for my, my child's college. That's, that's correct. But at the same time, you have to think about, okay, 
you are indeed paying for your child's college. You could take advantage of the programs that the government has for you, such as a lot of these loans are very low interest. If you want to pay for your college, uh, child's college, uh, uh, that's great. Take that money, put it into uh, a money market fund. Uh, given today, you're going to get a pretty good interest rate, right? So go put that money somewhere where you'll invest it for the next four years. And then after four years, once your kid graduates, to pay off the student loan. That might be a better option for you to do than uh, to pay from the get-go. And uh, there, there are some really good advantages about that. The big thing is, of course, it's a fixed in interest rate. The interest rate doesn't uh, go up. There's a subsidized and unsubsidized loans. Subsidized loans is loans that uh, do not accrue interest throughout the period that the, the kid is a full-time student. So it's cash on the table. Don't let that cash on the table go away, right? Unsubsidized loans, uh, however, are loans that begin to accrue interest as soon as you begin to draw on them, okay? There is another category called the parent plus loans, and it has no standard limit. That means if your kid is going to go, has got an admission into MIT, has gotten an admission, the student fee, uh, fees are very high, right? Uh, it's okay. Sign, the, sign for that parent plus loan and that shall cover the gap, okay? Uh, and there's no standard limit. That means you can, you can there's an unlimited borrowing. There are, there are advantages there as well, okay? When you are going to do a, a parent plus loan, you are co-signing, yes, the, the responsibility is of the student. If the student doesn't pay, then they'll come after you, but uh, there are advantages. And I'll go over that as well. Then, the biggest advantage is, which is forbearance and deferment, right? Life happens to everybody. And when it comes to life, uh, you cannot guarantee all four years of, of your kid's education, your economic stability will be the same. It's really important to, uh, to think about that uh, because recessions happen. As you know, Microsoft laid off like 10,000 workers, all these kind of things do happen, right? Uh, at that time, finances can get squeezed. You're going out there borrowing on your 401k, which is the last thing you should do, right? Uh, those, those are the reasons why you should file your FAFSA. If circumstances change, then that's one thing. Another thing is if your kid is out of school and he has that student loan, he or she has that student loan, if they have a life event, like they lose a job or something like that, those student loans can be deferred. Those student loans can be, you know, uh, can be moved uh, out. Another thing is this, if your kid goes ahead and works for the US government, yeah, they make 120 standard payments um, and for 10 years, the whole student loan is forgiven. So if the whole student loan is forgiven, if you've actually paid for that student loan, like for the, for the student all those four years and your kid goes and works for a nonprofit, or works for a uh, the U.S. government, then you know for sure that that loan was going to go away, uh, and you just put the money down uh, for no reason. So you really don't know what your kid is going to do after four years. They could go and work for you know the government or the state government, and there could be other programs. Uh, companies might also uh, look at your students and say, "Okay, you really you're really doing well, and uh, we want to keep you." Provided you work for us for three, four years, we'll pay off your student loan. You want, you, those options do open up in various places. I can tell you that much. For example, uh, Northrop Grumman, where Isha is doing an internship, they pay for the master's program completely, fully, uh, provided you, you can be an employee for a certain period of time. So it doesn't matter which, where you go, they'll actually pay for the tuition. Then that's where it comes to student uh, loan, you know, where the forgiveness. Another thing is when you go private, you will have a, um, a standard payment that you have to make regardless of how much income you make. A lot of the government loans are based upon income driven. So if your kid go, gets out of school, he's making 12, you know, $36,000 a year, uh, then it's based upon that $36,000 a year income, he's going to be making the payment. So there's a percentage that's going to be taken up. Um, so just bear these things in mind. Um, 
And one of the biggest thing is there is no income limit. And I'll go over the website uh, shortly, show you that. Let me just escape. Uh, so I'm now exiting this uh, screen here. So let me go to one of the sites is the, the finaid.org website. If you go to a calculator here, right? You see this expected family contribution. You can go here to the expected family contribution. And this tells you like saying, okay, yeah, I'm just gonna put some numbers in and I wanna show you what, what comes out of this, right? You see your kid's dependent, you're in the state of California, your household size is three, which includes your kid, number of students in one, right? Uh, number of parents in the household, say two, right? Age is the oldest parent, I'm just gonna put 52 here, right? Uh, prior and file taxes, yes. I'm just gonna put the average gross income, which is uh, for Asians, it's around 160,000, right? Income tax paid, so let's just say at 30,000. Another thing to remember, when it comes to assets, your home is not to be counted. Your small business is not to be counted, okay? When it comes to your assets. So just remember that. Then parent, I'm just gonna say 60,000. One parent, the other parent is 100,000. Right. Um, let's just say a pay a savings of three hundred fifty thousand. I'm just gonna I'm plugging in numbers. Okay. Um, this is it. You know, just when it comes to net worth, right? Net worth is minus how your the house of residence. Anything outside that you have to count in. But if you're running it as a small business, that doesn't count either, right? So I'm just gonna say. Investments is 350,000, right? Zero, no. Chetanji, right. can I ask you a question here? Yes. Um, so personally me and most of the friends I talk to have questions around how this works behind the scene. Meaning if someone is making $200,000, say $100,000, like not 200, say 100,000, but they yeah. have million dollar assets. They might have inherited something, they might have invested in stocks, they have fixed assets, two houses, three apartments, three cars, but they don't have enough cash coming in, meaning their income is low. And then exactly opposite situation. Somebody might have $350,000 salary, but they don't have any assets. Yeah, so, so if you play? if you think about if you think about houses, right? Uh, if you if you put it into a company, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then that's a small business. It's zero. Right. No. So leaving the small business and house aside, mm -hmm. I understand that, right? that. That's clear. I mean, exclude them. But I'm saying anything outside of that. Okay. Here's what low, happens. Low, low then, income, low income, high assets versus high high income, low assets. Yeah. Right? How so you, it goes over the. That's why they understand that, right? So what they're going to look at look at is they're going to look at the gap between what you can cover in your you know your income, the net income. So if you got high assets and low income, right? Yeah. Uh, those are assets, they're not producing any cash for you. Right. They're not producing any cash, period, right? On a, mm -hmm. on a yearly basis. So they do take that into consideration. They do understand that, right? There are some things you just cannot, you know, like your own house, you cannot give up, things like that, right? So right. one of the big things that happens there is with FAFSA is they're trying to cover the gap between what you can provide to what the university is going to charge you. So there's no income limit, okay? I see. Does that make sense? So the cash cash matters more than the than the assets. assets. Correct. Yeah. So it's okay mm -hmm. to quit the job before you start. Your, your kids start going to college. <laughs> like, yeah, it's okay. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm not gonna say anything. Okay. Uh, you you, you gotta work part? with your tax guy. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> okay. So. I'm just what, to calculate one more question. Uh, oh. What about your 401k, it's Roth IRAs, and anything related to retirement? Well, the 401k is counted. So I'm just giving you, see, the expected family contribution is this much. Anything beyond that, they will cover for you. Okay? Make sense?
I, I have one quick question now. Mm -hmm. So uh, you just mentioned that uh, we should start looking up in October time. Yes. You should file your FAFSA in October. It's nothing to do with when we file the applications with the colleges, right? I can it's independent. It's nothing. It's completely unrelated. So, you know, kind of divorce the two, okay? So FAFSA needs to be filed in October, regardless of you, whether your kid is in college or whether your kid is going into college. So if your kid's going to go into college in September of 2024 for their first year, their freshman year, then this October file that FAFSA. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Please. Okay. So don't don't forget to do it in October because, like I said, money is first come first serve. Okay. Dorang, you can unmute yourself. Sorry. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. So uh, let's say if I file this October, right, uh, and I come up with the family contribution number. Uh, yeah. Come come next September, if my kid is going to a really expensive college, like right, yeah, and it, if that number exceeds the family contribution number, how right. do I reconcile the two? How how the, do I now go back? The university will work with the will will work with the federal student uh, aid, okay, your mm -hmm. FAFSA, and then they'll say, okay, this much money is going to come in from FAFSA, and that will be automatically given to your kid when they. Uh, when they join school. They will tell you exactly what the gap is. I see. I Make see. sense? Yeah. So very important, October. Okay? As sure. soon as it opens, do it. Okay. Sure. Okay? Because regardless, right? You don't, don't wait for it. Another thing is, when you file your FAFSA, guess what your student gets uh, in, uh, in addition? Their work-study programs that are, that are there in the university, right? Those are jobs that are reserved for people that have filed FAFSA on campus. So if your student wants to, if your kid wants to do a job on campus you know, to make, uh, make up for the gap, they can do that, mm -hmm. right? Nice. Also, another thing is when we talk about students, right? Not all students are equal, but at the same time, if the burden of the loan is on the student and if the student understands it, that they're taking a class that's costing them $5,000 uh, for going to that class for that semester, right? That financial burden is something that's needed to make that student actually say, okay, I got to really pass this, right? I got to really take advantage of the professor's office hours. I got to take advantage of um, these, uh, you know, the free tuition that's offered all these things. Well, one of the big mistakes a lot of Indian parents do is they, they, they display to their kids that they have unlimited amount of cash. Please don't talk to your kids about the cash you have. Shouldn't. That is not a discussion you should involve your kids with. Right? You can talk about the, the cost of going to college, try to make it, uh, uh, make them understand that this is an enterprise that they are getting into. So they are partnering with you and you have limited resources. I don't care if you're a millionaire or not, or a, you know, multi-millionaire. If you don't give that ahead of time, then kids are gonna say, okay, well, dad's gonna pay, right? I don't know, it's just my opinion, right? Yep. yep. So uh, I think it's some things that we as Indians do is counteractive because I can tell you this much, the rate of dropping out of university is very high in the first year. Lots of kids get in there um, uh, and then afterwards they fail on their first year um, because they have all, you know unlimited amount of cash. That's the one place that you shouldn't be giving cash. Right, you want them to succeed. And I'm going to be very frank with you. Certain universities, there are um, there there's marijuana floating around. There's all kinds of things floating around. So you taking care of your your kid, right, and um, making sure that they're not exposed to those undue influences. Uh, the easiest way to control that is control your cash. So. 
So, so this, you know, the, like I said, the site is there, the FAFSA site is there. If you go to this FAFSA site, you're gonna see, uh, you know, various things, there are calculators here, there's scholarship, there's a scholarship home, how to win scholarship, they're talking about scholarship scam, scholarships for the average students, you know, there are lots of lots of things. You know, there's a there's a database called the Fast Web Scholarship Database. Uh, you can go and on, look for those scholarships. Uh, a couple of things it can tell you if your girl, uh, if you have a girl and if she's going into engineering, uh, a lot of universities will actually pay a full ride scholarship for uh, girls that are going into engineering. Uh, there's a dearth of of women engineers. Uh, well, if you do your bachelor's in engineering. Can you do become a doctor? Of course. In this country, all you have to do is uh, make sure your coursework is is in is in line. Uh, you can get your engineering degree at the same time go become a doctor. That flexibility is there in the system for you to do that. So uh, take advantage of those things. You know, um, just giving you it as a tip. So just keep that in mind. Uh, the other thing is. For some reason, this Zoom thing is. Um... So this is the FAFSA, right? Where you've got, you've got, uh, you got to go to this uh, site, studentaid.gov. Uh, you got to fly, well, uh, you as a parent will have to create your own FAFSA ID. Just, uh, just remember that. And then the kid has to uh, create their own FAFSA ID. So there'll be two FAFSA IDs and they kind of link them together in the application form. So that's, uh, that's one thing that I've seen a lot of parents getting confused on, okay? Um, there's another thing called the PLUS loans. Uh, as a parent, if you want, you can apply for the PLUS loans. And what it does, it, it, uh, it covers the gap. One of the big things of the PLUS uh, loans I can tell you is this much, that Say you, if you as a parent became disabled, then that loan can be forgiven. Okay. Uh, another thing is if a kid loses a job or something like that, you could probably be on the hook, but it's going to be just by, by the you know by the time your kid finds a job. Uh, those are those are things that are available. So if there's a huge gap, this is another um, another avenue. Uh, so long as you've filed for the FAFSA, that you can avail yourself. Okay. Um, let me just go back here. So, so then, can you can you clarify the gap comment that you made? How do you okay. define it? So let's say, say, let's say UC system the cost is forty thousand, like twenty thousand tuition, twenty thousand expenses. Okay, how much loan yeah. do we get, and what's the gap? So let's just see this. If uh, I'm just going to say this, if it's if the school tuition is for a year is $60,000, okay? Mm -hmm. Your expected contribution is a $34,000, okay? FAFSA will cover this gap. Just the tuition, not the boarding and all that. No, tuition and boarding. So I that's you. That's a cost of attendance to school, okay? Complete cost of attendance. So they will cover that $26,000. How they'll cover it? They will cover it by, there's a Pell Grant, okay? Like I told you, grant is not to be paid, correct? Then yeah. they're subsidized, okay? And then there's an unsubsidized portion. Okay, only uh, the, if the Pell Grant covers it, the, the Pell Grant will cover it. Then they'll go to the subsidized. Then they'll go to the unsubsidized. And after that, they will go to the Parent Plus. Make sense? Yeah, yeah. But the okay. given, given, given the audience here, I see most of the Indian last names here, uh, our, our, fortunately, income level is much higher, three to four times higher than the national average in the US. So how many Indians will qualify for all these things? I mean, they qualify, at least you'll qualify for the Pell Grant, right? Somewhere. I see. Okay. The other thing that you're thinking about is also your student qualifies for what? 
work study. Right? Mm -hmm. And work study are research positions at the university. A lot of them are research positions. So in, in terms, it's a career building move too, right? Right. Yeah. So the salary, the salary or, or stipend they get student as part of this will be counted towards income? It'll be counted towards the scholarship that they've given. You see? Okay. So there's work study here. Got it. Right? Yeah. So uh, the various I had, uh, Yeah, I had one quick question. So I have been applying for FAFSA for the last three years. Uh, but like someone mentioned, you know, due to, you know, decent income, uh, we end up getting most pro mostly unsubsidized loans. Is there any yeah. advantage of taking unsubsidized loans because the interest rate is, you know, same as what we can get from the market? But are there any other advantages of getting uh, unsubsidized loans like tax benefits? Uh, unsubsidized loans, well, a couple of benefits, right? One, when your kid uh, graduates, he's making the payment. He gets to write that off on his income, income tax first. Second thing, if he or she is out of a job, doesn't have to pay that money, right? And doesn't have, you know, have to pay the interest either during that period. If he or she works for the US government or any uh, qualifying uh, nonprofit, within 10 years, that whole loan is written off. Right? So those are the advantages I can tell you about, right? Another thing is, it's actually tax beneficial when, when your kid is actually going to get that money, you know, like as a tax cut, right? Because he's made those interest payments towards his tuition. Make sense? Yes, makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I have one quick question. Uh, so, uh, we know in our community, uh, many students are dependent, right? It's based on visa. So all these like uh, facilities would differ in that case, like uh, depend on visa. They uh, don't. You have to be a US citizen or a, or a green card holder to qualify for the FAFSA. There are other categories that do uh, qualify such as asylum seekers and other things. There are other categories that do qualify. So just keep that in mind. Now, when it comes to international students, uh, the game's different because you're an F1 student. But if you're, if you're an international parent, and if you're trying to send your kid to a university here in the United States, I would suggest, and if they're not going to go into engineering, right, then I would say, suggest that you send them to a state college. Like a college and university is different here in the U United States. Colleges are usually places where, which are community supported. Even those uh, colleges uh, will offer F1 student visas. Just keep that in mind. And there the tuition fee is as low as, you know, $3,000 a semester um, for, for your kid, even lower sometimes, okay? So it, it's, it's, an, it's, a, it's an advantage, right? Uh, Why are you spending a, you know, I huge some more money. But getting into those, uh, there's some things like, you know, in California, there's the Santa Monica College, SMC, there's Cerritos College, there's, you know, there's various colleges here uh, that can, that your kid can go to for the first two years. Okay, thank you for clarification. Yeah. Can you explain again, uh, Dhananjay Mokashi here, can you explain again uh, regarding the college and university point, uh, Ricky? Elaborate okay. for international so, parent. So uh, colleges in the United States offer two-year associate degrees. Okay. So in India, you think about it like uh, instead of you going to engineering school, you went to get your diploma. Right. So those di diploma colleges will give you an will take the course for two years. So yeah. and then after two three years, they'll give you a diploma. So here, what you're doing is you're sending your kid to a college, which gives you a diploma. Beyond diploma, you can go into university. So you, you get admission, like for example, 
if you go to Santa Monica College, most graduates of Santa Monica College get to get, get into UCLA, uh, UC Los Angeles. Yeah. So they have a very high percentage that, uh, of SMC graduates that they accept into UCLA. Yeah, okay. Okay? Thank you. So I, I, can, I can put some links on for colleges that are there in, the, you know, in, in California, but there are others, you know, there are lots of colleges. And usually these are state-sponsored institutions that, you know, the, uh, the taxpayers are paying for going above and beyond that 10, 12-year uh, education. Uh, a lot of those uh, degrees that they are, the associate degrees that they offer, are geared towards uh, doing that diploma and then going into the workforce, or you can go to university. So there are two, two routes you can take if you want to. Any other Thank questions? You. So here's the spreadsheet that I've put up, right? So, you know, prepared for SAT, ACT. There's a whole bunch of activities I've put in here you know, uh, that you can go over. Another thing is there's a tab for data where you can keep all your data in one place, right? You can talk about the essay, where did you send your SAT scores to? You know, you can, yeah, a very typical question is, oh, what's your overall GPA based upon English and whatever. So just keep this ready and handy. Uh, it, this spreadsheet is really because I, you know, th these questions always come up like, or what's the, your father, what's his citizenship? What's his date of birth? And, you know, uh, date of marriage and stuff like that is all, always asked on applications. So keep, you know, if you keep the data centralized somewhere, please password protect it. There's a lot of, so, you know, PII in this, right? Another thing is you take a look at all the universities, okay? How much percentage uh, of these universities are giving grants? So for example, you can take a look at this. Juanita College in Huntington, Pennsylvania has uh, how many undergraduates? 1,693. How many people are getting grants? 100%, right? I mean, that's pretty high, correct? If you mm. think about it, right? Yeah. So the, there's a list here that's readily available, right? These are things that you got to think about, you know? So if you look at the University of San Diego, you, you, it offers 72% of the kids get some, you know, get grants. So that's the other thing. When you go to the university, your kids applying for MIT or very high priced university, it's important for you to ask and say, okay, how much percentage of you know, that is gonna be in scholarship based upon my kid, uh, where he is or where she is and what can I expect, right? And if, if like with Isha, I applied for RIT, the cost is $56,000 to attend they gave her a full ride scholarship with $56,000. So in net net, I'm paying zero for a private university. So don't shy away from private universities and applying to them, okay? Because they have money on, on hand sometimes, okay? So this is something, uh, keeping your FAFSA organized, you know, your parents' FAFSA, uh, you know, their FSA ID your FSA ID, what are the, you know, what are the things that you need to keep, keep that here, uh, keep a tab on your expenses, you know, and then for each university, create a tab. That way, when you visit that university, you have the address here, you have the university ID number, whatever ID number, when you established your account at the university, just fill that out, type in the password, all that stuff. Then you talk about, you know, get these details, you know, housing details. Okay, for housing between different halls. At universities, they have different categories of, of housing situations. Then there's different costs for each one of them. How much does it cost for, per semester? You know, um, the other gotchas are all these other miscellaneous fees that they tag on, you know? Like um, there's gonna be this writing lab fee or, you know, uh, parent orientation fee and whatnot. So just keep tab on these, these fees. You never know what the university will keep ta tagging on, right? So, uh, and then, okay, what's the address for the housing department? What is the deadline for you to get into 
uh, a lower cost housing than a higher cost housing or whatever it is, or a, high, or a certain building which is special for your uh, student's major. So a lot of universities will have um, certain wings of their housing reserved for only engineering majors. So only engineering majors can stay there, those kind of things. So try to find these things out and try to make sure that you meet these deadlines and have these deadlines kind of the, in one central place is better. Uh, so this is really a template that I provided. You can use it, expand it, do whatever it is, probably improve on it. You know, it'll, it'll really help the, the community. Yeah. So, uh, can you can I also talk about the uh, how do you leverage five hundred nine? Five hundred nines. I think you're gonna have to you're gonna have to look at your states. Um, I'm not. I know it's a savings account for your you know as your your kid, right? Those uh, certain states offer it, but I think you have uh, from what I've seen, at least on the state of Florida, that you can only go to a university within the state of Florida and then pay for it. They will not pay for a university that you go outside of Florida. One question on the Excel sheet. Uh, what was the actual start date for the college? Uh, so if you think about it right here, I've just put something, mm -hmm. right? You begin preparing two years ahead for your SAT, right? Then you take the SAT test, you know, um, two, at least minimum of two, right? You got to meet mm -hmm. with your school university counselor, make sure you do that. Develop a list of 20 universities that you want to visit, all that stuff. There's a timeline here. If you see this timeline, like even your FAFSA, get the FAFSA ready by 10-1. That's October 1st, right? Right, okay, got it. Right. So you got to adjust that 18 to 23, 24, you know, or 24, 25 timeline. As right. you see it fit, right? This is really for entry students. But one thing to remember that those students that are in their second and third and fourth year, they should also file their FAFSA in the first of all October. Do not delay, okay? Okay. So there's different things here, you know, like sending in your official high school transcript, you know? So. Make sense? Yep. So FAFSA has to be applied the October of the year before your college first year starts. Correct, correct. So FAFSA Please. needs to be applied for October before your kid goes, to the, the year before your kid goes to college. Yeah, so, so now the calculator page that you showed, I just went through that. It actually uh -huh. it asks uh, which grade the student would be. And it also lists like your sophomore year also does that mean like there is an opportunity even to tap onto it before yes yes so now if your kid has already been a freshman right mm -hmm. you paid for the university come this before october like on before october get everything ready on october 1st you apply for the fafsa so your kid is, has made that available to them okay no, but but they have not even finished 12. So how are they getting college admission? So I, I mean, that's the no, part I'm... The, again, they, uh, that's the difference I'm telling you. In the, at university, when you're doing your university uh, applications, mm -hmm. your university application GPA is only dependent upon your grades on 9, 10, and 11. Mm -hmm. 12 does not count. Mm -hmm. Okay. So mm -hmm. all everything is to your eleventh grade. Mm -hmm. Make sense? Got it. The twelfth grade is doesn't count. So you having to file, you have to file your FAFSA when your kid is in just entered their twelfth grade. One month after they enter their twelfth grade, which mm -hmm. is in September typically, you can apply for the FAFSA. Got it. Got it. Please do and, it. And the assets, like somebody also asked before. So mm -hmm. your income and asset minus your home and small business. Now, when the question is of asset, 401k IRA also is an asset, right? Correct. They, they okay. will guide you through it. They'll ask you all these things, okay. right? Mm -hmm. So just go through that. And another thing, even if it comes down to zero, right? Mm -hmm. Remember, your kid can get 
work study uh, mm-hmm. jobs. Mm-hmm. Your kid, you, if you have a life changing event of any sort, mm-hmm. right? say, uh, I've God forbid, uh, one of the parents becomes disabled, mm-hmm. you qualify for the FAFSA. Got it, got it. Right? No, for, yeah, so the key is. I mean, it, it makes sense that definitely that low income or low cash or low asset will get more aid compared to either higher income or higher asset or higher cash. Uh, yeah, totally you can always ask for parent plus loan where you can Got sign. It. Correct? Got it. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. So any other questions? Uh, this FAFSA looks to be more or less uh, for the U.S. citizens or who are into the green card uh, holders. What about the international parents? Other than the scholarships, what is options available in case you can? International pa- parents, like I said, uh, one is try to get as much scholarship from the university that you're going to, right? Okay. That you're going to. If your kid is going to your master's degree, try to see what which university can offer the most amount of money, right? Okay. Try not to go to the popular kids uh, on the block, popular universities on the block. Try to, to send your kid to universities that are not so popular, right? Um, uh, in India, I know there are various agencies that actually take fees and say, I guarantee your kid will get admission into uh, college. At the same time, they're also receiving money from the university for sending kids to their university. Okay. So there's a lot of dishonesty there. So be very careful. You know, so why should they be taking money from the university to, to send a kid uh, from India to that university? They do that because, you know, the university knows okay, we can get full-time, uh, you know, fees and a lot of money from this, this student. But if you go to universities, like I can tell you, if uh, kids applied from uh, outside, they applied for something like Utah State University or uh, Cal State, you know, uh, let's just say they applied for you know, Colorado State University or Washington State University, you, you could actually get more money, right? Because they're not so popular in the list. And I can just tell you, I can vouch and tell you this much that. Post your one year that you, um, I'm sure parents, this is kind of controversial, but post your f- graduation in your first job, okay? Yeah. The name of the university really doesn't count. It is your grades and it's how well you interview for your first job. Mm. So really think about it, you know? I mean, I, I, it really doesn't matter. And then afterwards, once you do your first job, it's your job experience. You say, yeah, you went to Harvard, so what? You know? <laughs> yeah, I'm not kidding, it's Lela. Okay? True, true. So it's, it's the work experience. Did you get fired? Did you, you know? Did you, did you do really well in your first job? Right? Those are the things. Just to add uh, a little brief to it, uh, Dhananjay Ji joined us from Abu Dhabi. Uh, mm-hmm. So Dhananjay, thank you for joining us. He's our SMAP uh, leader there in that country. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was going to respond to your question, Dhananji Ji, by saying the home countries do have good options. So if I'm not sure about Abu Dhabi, but at least in India, they got really good uh, loan options nowadays. Like yes, pretty, that's true. Pretty attractive. Uh, so you, you borrow money in Indian rupees uh, for education in U.S. And that right. uh, most of the big banks now started offering that. Yeah. Even when I went to school, they, they offered it. Like, you know, Bank of Baroda which I don't know if it's still around, but you know, the state banks used to offer loans. Uh, I think now ICICI and uh, HDFC do offer student loans, correct? And the problem is Vijay and uh, Chai, that uh, the people who are in the Middle East region where they have been treated as a non-resident Indians, so uh-huh. they are not for resident Indians, nor they will be able to take full advantage of, uh, you know, uh, resident uh, country benefits like what we are discussing here, or in some Europe also same issue. So right. getting student loans for NRIs 
to the other countries uh, generally is uh, uh, treated differently. That was my point. So no, that that's true. Of... That's very true. It, it all depends upon the country that you're coming from because, you know, you really need to do your research there. True, that's true. what I can tell you. Okay, you. I have... I have one question, maybe Isha can chime in too. So like uh, typically our community folks, most people cr try to crack up more credits than 26 credits uh, required for high school graduate, at least in Texas or California, whichever, every state has their own requirements. But mm -hmm. most through summer schools and et cetera, might crack up higher, meet that target a little ahead, right? So at that point, doing more AP or more dual credit is sensible or just stop at that level and start taking, like let's say in Isha's curriculum, she had intro to computer science one, two, crank up one or two subjects like you, that. You and can, but yeah, but what I would suggest is this, right? Rather than take APs, here's what I would suggest. If your kid is going to go to uh, uh, university, right? Mm -hmm. Local colleges offer courses. So mm -hmm. make them go to those local colleges, take those courses, those courses will actually count as far better credit in at the university, hmm. right? So, for yeah. example, if there's a local college near Texas A&M, right? Mm -hmm. Texas A&M will tell your students if you can't take the class here in the summer, you can take this class at the local college. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Make them got take those classes at the local college; they're going to get credit there. Yeah, got it, got it. Yeah, so right? take so, leverage community college and all that like Pierce College in California and all that. Right, so you know, go to the local college, take the course, you know, that might be, and again, all APs, right? If your kid is going into engineering and he does, he, he or she takes AP world history, mm -hmm. university is not gonna give credit for that. Mm -hmm. They're gonna say, yes, there's a credit, but you, based upon the credits for you to graduate, I'm giving you a credit, but at the same time, that class is not a required class for becoming God. an engineer. So yes. what's the point? You know, you, you sweat it for no reason. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. One question I have, like, since you touch upon the community college, do, do we have some idea about like the mid-college program where it can be done from some of, like say, junior and senior year of the uh, high school can be done into these colleges, right? The community colleges, and those can be carried forward. Do you have- like to look at your own state. Uh -huh. and uh, do some research there, is what I'm going to tell you. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Tarakji is in uh, Northern California, San Jose, and uh, California. Yeah, so then, yeah, the state colleges, if you're going to send your kid to state colleges for certain courses, mm -hmm. by all means, do it, provided it's relevant to the uh, education. One of the big things that you can do is, you know, you've got these math, uh, math classes or general ed classes, mm -hmm. You can tell you, take those at the local university, you know, community college, right. and then ask the university to give you credit for it. For that, okay. Ten thousand dollars, you know, as opposed to you paying what five hundred dollars at the local community college. Exactly. Only we just need to make sure that those points will be carried forward to the university and university. Correct. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So it's very important that your kid also has a goal to achieve in at the university. That's another point because. Uh, you know, I was talking to Vijayji the other day, and oh, just remember, your kids are going to come under certain influences of professors and things like that, that'll kind of draw them into their major. Uh, so be very careful. There's a lot of marketing there, too, because um, your kids going into engineering and suddenly they're changing into, you know, social sciences or something like that, because they were really impressed with the professor. Uh, just remember that they need to make that research saying, okay, how much salary are you going to get by going and doing that, right? And again, you as a parent have to understand that probably this influence is not necessarily good and make your kid aware that they're going to be professors that are going to be so impressive that you're going to say, oh, no, I'm going to change my career and do that. The U.S. system is so good that it offers the flexibility, but at the same time, there's the cons of it, right? The cons is your kid will be suddenly changing majors. If you suddenly change majors, you're gonna to add to college costs and university costs. So yeah. making sure your kid is really set to where they're going is important. If they want to say, oh, I want to join as undeclared, no, no, go to community college then. Because I don't want you, know, you to be an undeclared. 
Yeah, so can I introduce uh, Dr. Pradeesh Shukla because I'm looking at the names and saw Dr. Yeah. Pradeesh Shukla and Yatriji as well. Uh, Yatriji is a professor there and uh, Dr. Shukla was a uh, vice chancellor of Vice Chancellor of Entrepreneurship Program at Chapman University, one of the very reputed uh, management college in Southern California. Dr. Shukla is here as well. Um, Dr. Shukla, you have any perspective on this uh, changes of courses and things like that? Yeah. Changes. Yeah. First of all, you know, I'd like to thank both of the presenters. I think you did an excellent job. Very good, detailed information. The Excel spreadsheet and the walking through the FAFSA website. You know, all of that is really great. I think, you know, I absolutely agree that we see a lot of individuals where they change majors. And what happens is that it adds up taking an extra year of their life. So you want to really be careful in terms of not switching majors. Now, if you really don't enjoy, if you don't really enjoy the graduate programs or the senior courses that you're taking, then in that case, you want to go ahead and switch majors. But you want to be careful, like you say, that you're taking out student loans, you have to repay the loans. So you want to think about the career prospects with different jobs. Unfortunately, at Chapman and other schools, we get individuals who graduate with social justice, social science, sociology, and then they come back and they say, no one told me that there weren't career opportunities here. Well, if you're an adult over age 18, you should be able to do research. They're on the smartphone every day. You should know that what are the career prospects? All you have to do is go to salary.com, look at the average salaries. So yeah, I would say definitely encourage your child, maybe have them have their selected major and a minor, which they could fall back on if they want to switch. But I've seen some students where they end up taking five, six years to get a four-year degree, which is unfortunate for them and their parents and you know their own expenses. But but one other final thing I would add, I think, you know, you're absolutely right. Apply for the FAFSA as soon as possible, October 1st, the earliest deadline. Also with the universities, they'll offer their package in addition to government aid. And some of those are negotiable. So if you are having a high GPA in high school, if you have a high SAT score, you're sort of like in a bidding war against other universities that want to accept you. So you tell your financial aid director at the college, I'm getting a better package from this other university. Can you match it? Because I really like your mission. I like your school, but I can't afford it unless you increase the package. And this is not government aid, but it's within the control of the college and university. But that's all I wanted to add. And you know, I think you did a great job with the presentation. Yeah, very excellent point, and one Shuklaji. And one small thing I would like to add, uh, this is Yatri Shukla. I would like to add is I've had students who take my course to find out that uh, before they took the same course under a different number. And uh, so it's, I teach math calculus. And so they take a calculus course with, with somebody else. Then they realize that that doesn't count for your uh, business major. So then they have to take the same course again under a different number. So please don't waste your time energy without checking with your um, advisor to make sure that you are taking the right course because you end up wasting time and money uh, taking the wrong course. Okay. So I, ha I, have a, I have a question uh, since the professor mentioned about calculus, right? So my daughter is going into 10th uh, grade and she's taking AP calculus. So, but there is also an option of dual credit college calculus. Then in that case, does it probably make sense to go for a dual credit college calculus instead of everybody chasing AP calculus, A, B, A, B, C? So for that, I would like to say that first find out from the university they want to go to and make sure that they will accept your dual college credit because you might take that thinking, oh, this is a good class to take. You spend... I don't have to spend money, but you spend so much energy and headache and stress in trying to pass that uh, BC or, um, uh, you know, calculus course. And you find out that that course is not accepted at the university you are going to. So first find out from the university you want to go to and make sure that the course you want to take is going to count for credit. Got it. Got it. Okay. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you, uh, Yatriji, as well as uh, Dr. Shukla. 
I had a couple of, I know we are right, right out of, like really out of time, uh, but a couple of minor questions, personal questions, right? Uh, one is uh, use of credit card versus debit card. Uh, well, $40,000, a lot of spend, right? So why write a check for $40,000? Might as well use credit card. Any perspective on that, uh, Chaitanyaji? They'll charge you fees. Usually be careful when you're paying it. You know, so you'll say, if you're paying by credit card, they're going to charge you 2% or 3% transaction fees. Be very careful because that can amount to a lot of money, right? How about other expenses? So like boarding card, like food, paying for food. If they don't charge you extra 2%, 3% for a credit card transaction, should we use credit card or debit card? If they're not going to charge you, then go ahead and use it's based upon your personal financial condition, right? And you being able to pay that off, you know, again, uh, your credit cards are going to accrue interest. So, um, you know, just, just it's it's up to you to manage the, those finances. So as Sorry. far as possible, you know, try not to use a debit card because if that data gets leaked out somewhere else, you have an issue. Um, so I wouldn't use a debit card for sure. Yeah, another issue with the, with the debit card is uh, there is no fraud guarantee. Generally, yeah, or no fraud guarantee, meaning you, you, you make a purchase online, you, you buy books, for example. You yeah. buy books, books don't get delivered at home. You can go to credit card company and dispute that transaction since the right. goods were never delivered to me. You cannot do the same thing on, on the bank, which is debit card, because your money is gone. It's hard to get the right. money back once it's gone. Yeah, even books, the way I see it is if your kid's going to go into college, uh, university, uh, and if they're going to know that they're going to take another class, uh, the next class, their, their college advisor would have said, you're going to be taking this class. And under this professor, it'll be wise for the student to go and find out as to uh, Who's taking who's taken that class before? Um, can they give them the books and the notes uh, if possible? It, it just as an aid, no, you know, just just something to keep in mind. But professors do change textbooks, so. <laughs> Oh, I also want to point out, like, if you have lab kits, lab kits can be pretty expensive for lab classes. So sometimes you'll find like. Um, like your tech person for your uh, major will have like extra lab kits that students gave away. So there's always an option to get like old lab kits for free. So you don't have to pay that $50 or $60 fee for a lab kit. Um, yeah, and then also for food, I have a recommendation that you charge your like card. So if you charge your card, um, there's like a student card so they usually have like, you can probably put money in like the, um, we call it dining dollars at my school. So if you put money in your dining card, you can pay for food without tax. So that sometimes reduces the money you pay for on campus food a lot. Um, so that's another recommendation. It's a good one, yeah. Hi, this is uh, Ramesh Thali. I, wa I want to bring up some uh, concern. I mean, to AI and intelligent automation. A lot of uh, my clients are coming back now to automate uh, really very uh, professional jobs. What do you think? How the kids or parents should prepare in this backdrop? I'm seeing on the my business side, but what I'm concerned is. You know, like what's going to happen to the kids who are going to schools now thinking that they will have a job and how they need to cope up with all this uh, change is going to come in pretty soon. It's going very fast. Well, my opinion there, it's really an opinion, is jobs that actually touch human beings are never going to go away. They cannot be AI resourced out. No AI is going to help you know, where I need to uh, service a client and talk to a client, right? Yeah, of course. Yeah, that's true. So, yeah, meaning, meaning having that addition to whatever career you do would be the route I would take. It's an opinion, you know, uh, others may have others. I have a small input mm -hmm. for uh, textbooks. When we were talking about textbooks, books. A lot of times professors have an additional copy sitting around in their office. Uh, they will not just give it away the first time you go and ask for it. Um, you know, you have to go in and say you like the course, you have 
you are enjoying the course, you know, first two weeks, you know, that's the good time to go and introduce yourself. You enjoy everything. And then say, by the way, I really am looking to get a textbook. And I looked at the price and I really can't get a textbook right now. Would you happen to have an older older version of the copy of the textbook, an extra copy that I can borrow? They usually have an extra copy. Or you can even go to the library reference text, desk and uh, ask for, we are required to put a text book in the reference desk. And sometimes when we have extra copies, we put put extra copies there. Just borrow the textbook from there. You probably don't need the textbook all the time unless you need to do uh, study for your exams. So a lot of these professors do a lot of PowerPoints and share PowerPoints with you. So don't need the textbook all the time. If it is a course where the textbook is very expensive, there are other ways to get textbook for free <laughs> or used textbook. Yeah. Amazon has the borrow textbook where you can rent it out for the course. Hmm. Awesome. I think uh, we're almost uh, out of time now. Uh, anyone else? If you have any questions, uh, you can ask. If you haven't received a copy of these worksheets that uh, Chetanaji has created, uh, let us know. Send us an email and we'll be happy to send it. I got 20, 30 emails in the chat. So I send the email to everyone so they have it. Uh, but if anyone needs it, please uh, let me know. I have one a question regarding one of my friends uh, whose wife is going to came here. So I know it's kind of like different topic, but what option do you have uh, uh, like for H4 studying or F1? And what is the financing option for studying on H4 as well? So if you have any idea. I would only say this, that I think uh, universities only accept based upon F1 that I know of, but local community colleges may accept H4s. I, I, you know, you might want to okay. inquire with the universities. Where okay. Can, yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much, Chaitanji. Thank you. All right. So looks like... Uh, Everyone is good. No one has any questions. So I really wanted to thank Chaitanyaji, uh, Isha. Really appreciate your time to uh, educate us on the process as well as how we can maximize or optimize our spend in the colleges. So it's really, really, really important. I think some of us who have been here for 20, 30 years in the US, we have some idea. Uh, students who are going away from house for the first time, right? Uh, I'm sure have all these questions and great to have this guidance that you provided here. Uh, Dr. Shukla Yatriji, uh, thank you so much uh, as well for your in input. And uh, as I mentioned, SMAP Youth, SMAP Youth is is uh, like a child organization of Shivaji Maharaj Antarashtri Parivar. And uh, as also mentioned at the beginning, whom some of you might have missed, uh, we have uh, two clubs, SMP Youth Club in Mountain House. Arya Kulkarniji started the club there. Uh, and uh, another in Seymour, Connecticut. Uh, Abhishek uh, Kolteji started the club there. So if anyone of you want to start clubs or, or get students involved in the positive activities, which is exactly what we do, uh, build leadership, uh, help them out with things like this so that they don't get confused and get carried away in different directions. So that's the mission of SMAP Youth. And uh, yeah, thank you all for participating today. And uh, we had a great, great discussion. Thank Have you. a wonderful rest of the day. Chaitanya, any last words? Isha, any last words? Last words? Isha? No, uh, no last words. Thank you. <laughs> yep. All the best to all the students who are now going to start the college, and uh, all the best to the parents for writing mm -hmm. the checks, guys. Uh, Forty thousand dollars per year. That's after tax. You have to make sixty thousand dollars, pay taxes twenty thousand, and write a check for forty thousand dollars per year, right? For for four years in a row. Uh, so all the best for that. And take some advantage of the advice that you got from Chaitanyaji, how to get free college admission. Yeah, I know so, those as well, yeah. Like Dr. Shukla, yeah. Uh, correct, correct. Yeah, if anyone of you have any follow-up questions, please let us know. We'll be happy to connect with uh, connect you with uh, Chaitanyaji, Isha, or whoever, yeah. Dr. Shukla, uh, for any further questions you might have. Yeah. With yeah. that, uh, thank you very much, and have a wonderful rest of the day. Jai Shivarai, guys. Have a nice day. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.